house today. And we pray that the spirit of the living God will surround all of us as we worship this day. Thank you to everyone who came out in support of our United Methodist Men's Breakfast yesterday morning with Sheriff Leon Lott. Special thanks to Dave Barnes, even though he is sick and was unable to be here for doing so much work to plan and prepare for that great event. Friends, there are lots of exciting things going on here at Bethel. I encourage you to carefully read through your bulletin this morning, through a copy of the January newsletter that went out this week, and prayerfully discern how God might be calling you to grow in your faith through our programs and ministries here at Bethel. As we celebrate the living God among us, let us breathe deeply and give thanks for his graciousness to us. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship together today.
Let us pray. Holy God of glory and majesty, today you call us by name. You call us to a ministry of generosity and of service, to a time of sharing and giving thanks. We pray in this moment for the courage to answer your call. As we hear once more today the story of your son's baptism, open our hearts that we might experience again the renewing power of rebirth in the Holy Spirit. Inspire us in this time of worship that we may claim our own identity as your beloved. We pray in the name of our brother Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, I invite you to stand as you are able and join in our opening hymn, number 369, Blessed Assurance. Let us sing together. remain standing, let us profess our faith together using the words of the Historic Apostles' Creed as printed in our bulletins. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated. This time we invite children of all ages to join with Miss Louise down front for our children's time. everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. I don't have a space. Well, I'll sit down right here with y'all. All right. It's good to see your faces this morning. All right. So does anybody know what today is? Sunday. Sunday. That's right. <clears throat> But we, we're celebrating a special Sunday, and it's called, do you know it, Christian? What is it? Baptism of the Lord. Baptism of the Lord Sunday. So uh, we, were, we just celebrated Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ. Now we're celebrating Jesus being baptized. What is this? Water. Water. And um, what do we use water for? Drinking. 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 Washing. Mm -hmm. Baptism. Dehydrated. De to be hydrated. <laughs> Swimming. That's right. We use water for uh, <clears throat> various purposes. <clears throat> but we also use water for like what Wyatt said, for baptismal. And in G the days of Jesus, John the Baptist was baptizing many Jewish people because that was their tradition back then. And what was the symbolization of that water? What did that water do for them? Yes, James. Mm -hmm. why, when, why did they get baptized? They might have did something wrong. And when they were dipped in the water and they came back, they were what? They were forgiven. They were forgiven. They were. They repented. God. Um, it was a uh, tradition to be dipped in the water, to be risen back up, and you were clean, made white as snow. And Jesus wanted to be baptized. Did Jesus do anything? to cause him to, to sin where he needed to repent? No, but why do you think Jesus might have wanted to be baptized? Because he, he didn't came to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. He didn't want to do away with those traditions. He wanted to keep them going. So when Jesus was baptized, and when he came back up with John the Baptist, <clears throat> they saw, behold, they saw a dove, and the Holy Spirit came down. And God said, this is my servant in whom I'm well pleased. That's the symbolization of this dove right here on this banner. Isn't it a blessing that we can be made clean of our sins, that God can wash us as white as snow earth? The, the things that we have done that may have been wrong, that we feel guilty of, when we ask God for forgiveness, he is careful to forgive us of our sins. We should repent and sin no more. Amen? Amen. Let us have a prayer. Father God, thank you for baptism. Thank you, Lord, that we can be washed and made, whole. and made whole. Help us, Help us to, love to love you and others. And others. In Christ's name, In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Choir, what a beautiful anthem. Thank you. My friends, as we go to God in prayer this morning, I invite you to lift up any prayer concerns that you have, joys or concerns that you would like shared among us. I will start by asking for your prayers for J.B. Barnett, our church custodian, who's had a couple diabetic episodes this week and was unable to work due to illness. Please pray that J.B. is better soon. Also for Dave Barnes, who is at the VA hospital with a pretty serious infection in his foot. Continued prayers for Margie Jackson, who has gone from the hospital to Encompass for rehab after a bout of pneumonia and RSV. And for Brenda Harper's granddaughter, Eden, who was also diagnosed with RSV this week, which we know is so scary for a little four-month-old baby. Are there other prayers you would like to ask? Thank you, Tom. Prayers for the family and friends of Harold Klein, who died this week. Noah. Prayers for our friend Chris Huggins, who's unable to be here today because he has upcoming foot surgery. Thank you. Yes, Bill? Good. Prayers of joy for your family as you celebrated love and a wedding, and special prayers for your grandson who was able to be home for this celebration as he goes back to serve in Djibouti. Prayers for him and for our military. Friends, for all that we name aloud and all that we hold close in our hearts, let us go to God. Creator of the universe, we stand amazed at your power and glory. We are often eager to worship you and offer our praise, but we are also often reluctant to answer when we hear you calling our name. We sing songs of tribute here in the sanctuary, but we often shy away from the river, lest we be baptized with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us when we forget your promise to be with us always, when we hold back, thinking that we are not enough, that we are not able to do that which you call us to do. Fill us with the power of your ever-present love and strengthen us to be signs of your goodness in this world today. As we come to worship today, God, we come to encounter the one who knows each of us by name who walks with us in grace and love. We come to reaffirm the blessing we receive through our baptism. On this baptism of the Lord Sunday, we remember your saving actions through history, all of the times that you have met us where we are, that you have opened up your arms as you opened up those heavens, that you have called us by name, said you are forgiven, you are made new. Help us to rededicate our lives to you today. As we have lifted before you the names of people near and dear to us in need of your touch and mercy, we also lift up ourselves as people who need to be made new, who need to be forgiven and redeemed. May we leave this place today assured of your love, assured of your presence, and assured that you will equip us to do all that to which you call us. This we pray in Jesus' name, lifting our hearts with grateful voices as we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, each week as we share our tithes and offerings, we pray that God might multiply our gifts and use them for his service and his glory here in our community and in our world. This year we've decided to celebrate the good work that God does with our gifts. So each second Sunday of the month, we're going to have a mission moment where you'll hear from a church member about how God's work is being done through your gifts and giving. Brenda Harper, I thank you so much for being willing to go first in our mission moment, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, <clears throat> good morning again. And Julie, that prayer was just absolutely awesome because the way the ministry got started is the backpack ministry at Bethel. I heard about six and a half years ago a sermon about feeding the hungry in our community. And God kept tugging at my heart. But the time just wasn't right because you know, God's timing is perfect timing. Julie came in and I was in a meeting and I mentioned it to her. And she said, Brenda, go forward. So that's what I did. And I thought, Lord, how am I gonna do all this? But anyway, I met with the guidance counselor at Satchel Ford. And then Julie said, you need to talk to Travis. They, and so I did, I called Travis. And there was monies that were available for a backpack ministry. So everything just fell into place. It was God's perfect timing. But this couldn't have happened without some members of the church and so forth. Um, initially, members of the church and the Rotary Club came together and packed the bags for Satchel Ford. We feed 35 children every week during the school term. Um, and I want to send a great thank you to the Rotary Club and to Travis for the work that he puts in. And I've had members of the church that when Lem and I were not available to take the backpacks to the school, um, they helped us out. Um, Bill Lucas has helped me out. Debbie and Al Carter have helped me out. Um, but it's a joint effort. This year it was a little bit of a challenge, and I stressed over it. You know the price in items have gone way up. And when I got the invoice from Harvest Hope, instead of the 4,800 and something dollars, it was 8,000. So um, anyway, I finally got in touch with Harvest Hope and a huge corporation had given a tremendous check that was only to be used for backpack ministry. So we were able to come up with the rest of that money, and it was great. It was absolutely awesome. But then the Rotary Club has to have some, what you call, skin in the game. So Travis came up with an idea, and it has worked greatly. Um, Lim and I go to um, Sam's and purchase items to where we pack a little, it's some, um, not so much nutritional, but it's not really bad either. But we pack about 900 to 1,000 bags each school term, and the Rotary Club does that. I want to give a thank you to the Holroyd class. They came up with a great contribution for these snacks because Bethel pays for the snacks. And also, um, the men's club pitched in and they also gave money. And we have one of our Bethel members, Bonnie Spees, I'm calling you out, Bonnie, <laughs> that has also given money for this. But each year we have to come up with money for the snacks. So if there's anyone that would like to make a contribution on top of your regular giving, you may do so, but do a separate envelope and just mark it for backpack ministry. 
I have a couple of the packs that I'm going to leave in the narthex this morning. And if y'all want to take a look at what Rotary Club packs and what Harvest Hope sends, they'll be in the narthex so you can get a better idea about what we do. Um, so it's 35 children every week during the school term. So um, if God just is, gives you a tap on the shoulder saying, I can help with that, just like for a year and a half, he would not leave me alone. I thought, finally, Lord, I give. I'm going to do it. Okay? So maybe you'll have that same little tap on the shoulder. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. May we all say yes when God taps us on the shoulder. Friends, let us give to God with joy and thanksgiving today. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the blessings upon blessings that you have poured out onto us. As we offer our gifts to you today, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, just as you did to your Son on his baptism day, that through our hands and our hearts we may do your work in the world. As we offer ourselves to you, bless us with your strength, and with your courage that we might join in your son, bringing about his business throughout the world. We pray in his holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
My friends, it is so good to be with you on this Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the third chapter beginning with the 13th verse. Hear these words. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John in the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, Just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven proclaimed, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And we give thanks to God for it. Any of you, like me, took an introductory or introduction to psychology class in college, you probably learned about something called the mirror test. In the 1970s, child psychologists wanted to know when children started seeing themselves as themselves, as a unique and distinct person in the world. And so they placed a dot of red lipstick on the child's nose placed them in front of a mirror, and observed what happened. Young infants seemed to think that there was another baby in the mirror in front of them. Starting about one year of age, the babies would be hesitant, not sure who that was looking back at them from the mirror. Toddlers, however, could look in the mirror and recognize their own reflection. Scientists knew this because instead of touching the red dot on the kid in the mirror, they would touch the red dot on their own face. They could realize that the mirror was showing them themselves and that the red dot was actually on their nose. Now, like many psychological experiments, there's some disagreement about how useful or universal this knowledge is. But I find it really fascinating to think that the way to tell if a person knows themselves is whether they recognize their own reflection. Which brings us to the Gospel of Matthew today. In the third chapter, we have the baptism of Jesus, who just last week was one of those babies and toddlers, but now strides into the scene a fully grown man. Seems to me that every year we emerge rather abruptly from the sentimental, familiar scenery of a Bethlehem stable to this barren wilderness landscape with this wild and crazy prophet in strange clothes, eating locust and honey, and carrying out this odd task called baptism. Now, Jewish people were used to ritual baths, places to cleanse themselves, clean up after coming into contact with blood or dirt or death. They had to be ritually clean before they could go to temple to worship. But to be unclean and sinful were not necessarily synonymous. For example, a woman was unclean after giving birth, but no one thought that having a baby was a sin. But we hear in Matthew that John is not interested in outside cleanliness. He's interested in inside cleanliness, cleaning up the heart. John's baptism's point specifically to mark the moment when a person repents, when they turn away from sin and turn towards God, when they start on a new way of living. And John is a reluctant baptizer. If you read through the different gospel accounts, you see that 
John gets pretty upset when people that he thinks of as too sinful come to confess and be clean. He's worried that they won't truly change. In today's passage, it's Jesus that walks up and gets in line. And John just about comes undone. He stands and tries to block the way of Jesus, protesting that this is all wrong. John knows in his prophet's way that Jesus is the one to come, the one who will be God's strongest agent on earth. John says, no, 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 Jesus, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, not the other way around. Why are you coming to me? And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus answers, Allow this now, because it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. My friends, these are Jesus' first words in the Gospel of Matthew. His opening speech, Allow this now, because it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. I don't know about you, but those words don't exactly make me want to jump into the river. They sound so dry and lackluster. It is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. It doesn't help maybe to answer those questions that so many of us have, scholars and theologians, children alike. If Jesus was without sin, why did he need to be baptized? It's a great question. Louise gave a pretty great answer to it. I don't have a specific example, but I think there was just something. Something about this idea of Cousin John's baptism that made Jesus trek all the way out from his Galilean hometown to the ancient storied Jordan River. Something about it seemed like the right thing to do. To fulfill all righteousness is a fancy phrase. What it means is to do God's right thing. And so John allows Jesus to be baptized, dunking him in the water like so many of his neighbors before him. Except this time, as the baptism is happening, the skies tear open and the Holy Spirit comes soaring down like a dove like the dove that carried the olive branch to Noah, marking peace with God and God's people. It's as if God has been waiting for just the right moment, for Jesus to do the next right thing. And God's voice says, This is my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This public proclamation, an unmistakable declaration, this is mine. I am claiming him. I can picture Jesus balanced there between the waters below and the heavens above, all of creation pointing to the fact that this man, this Jesus, is not just God's agent or God's prophet or God's right-hand man, but God's son. God made flesh. And so I come back to the mirror test. And I wonder if part of why Jesus had to be baptized is so that he and we could see it. So that Jesus could look in the mirror and the water below him and the heavens above and know that he was to be the reflection of God. He's only 30 years old, but now is the time to show God's face to the world. Whoever Jesus was before this moment, whatever stories his mother had told him, what other prophecies his father had shared, I wonder if this was the moment when he truly felt who he was to be in the world. Because from this moment, Jesus hits the ground running. My friends, when we look at Jesus, his actions, his words, his death, 
his life, we see more clearly than in any other mirror what God looks like, what God cares about, what God can do. Jesus becomes the mirror in which we can most clearly see God. The funny thing is that even as Jesus looks in the mirror and sees the face of God, his baptism makes it possible for us to do the same. Because we make this claim too, that in our own baptisms we are united with Christ. God bless you. In fact, the Apostle Paul makes the claim several times. But in his letter to Galatians in the third chapter, he says that all who have been united with Christ in baptism put on a Christ-like set of clothes. In our baptisms, we are given the chance to look in the mirror and to see a bit of God reflected back at us. That image of God that we are given to carry as this unique, remarkable person shaped and crafted by God's own hands. We get to look in the mirror and see the face of God because Christ shows us how God's face can look like our own. Paul says we are united with Christ. But in baptism, Jesus chooses to be united with us. Jesus goes marching down into the river in the silt and the mud and the rocks to experience life the way that we do. For him, righteousness is being with us. God decided that what is what was right for God to be one of us, up close and personal, to show us who we are, and what we can be. This is more than just simple solidarity, more than a prince coming to try on the life of the peasants before heading back to the castle, empathetic but untransformed. Jesus is truly one of us, fully human and fully divine. Through his baptism, he chooses to take us on and to become one with us. In the year following my ordination, I had the great privilege to go to the Holy Land with Bishop Taylor. And on that trip, we visited the Jordan River. Honestly, it wasn't what I expected. I had expected glory and sacredness and beauty. But I have to tell you, despite the best efforts of the tourism board, I was disappointed, maybe even a little disturbed. Granted, our trip to the Jordan was about halfway through a two-week long, arduous trip. I was tired and a little cranky. The parking lot for buses was about a mile away from the actual river site. It's not actually the site of Jesus' baptism. That's on the Jordan side of the river. American tourists stick to the Israeli side. That's where this infrastructure is. On the way there, there were signs lining the road in Hebrew, Arabic, and English warning us to stay on the path because the dusty land on either side held the occasional landmine from wars and conflicts gone by. The river itself was shallow, muddy, sort of this slimy yellow-brown color. A common joke among the tour guides is that the river holds more history than water. But I watched as these other eager pilgrims around us donned the white robes available for sale in the gift shop, knelt down in the riverbed, and had their heads dunk backwards. I found myself wondering about leeches and slime and being really grateful that United Methodists do not believe in rebaptism. 
I watched those folks come out of the water, grinning with holy mystery, their white robes stained with what looks like cat puke, okay? And they had twigs and leaves stuck in their hair, and yeah, ugh, is really how I felt. I had really wanted to have a spiritual awakening at the Jordan River, this glimpse of God's holiness and echo of God's voice. But all I really saw was that the Jordan River is a place you get dirty, not clean. But as I think about it today, I wonder if maybe that wasn't the whole point. Jesus could have gone to some bubbling spring or some crystalline lake. He could have been baptized under a streaming waterfall like a romance cover novel. He could have brought water from a rock if desired like Moses before him. But instead, Jesus was willing to get down into the mud, into the dirty reality of a human world. Jesus was willing to pick a path amidst landmines. Jesus was willing to get sun in his eyes and water up his nose and slime in his hair, if that is what it took. Jesus was willing to be dumped all the way into being human, just so we could see God up close. Just so we could see God with us. My friends, the baptism of the Lord is a dazzling scene. The heavens open up and a dove descends and this voice maybe even sends a sparkle out over the muddy waters. But this is not a house of mirrors. It is not a cheap trick. Jesus really came into the muck and the mud and the slime to reflect God's glory to the world. In the mirror test, psychologists knew babies understood themselves to be themselves when they touched the red dot on their own nose. As you leave worship today, you'll see a simple bowl filled with rocks. It's a brown bowl, intentionally so. The water looks a little dark, but it's not dirty, I promise. I'm going to invite you as you leave to dip your hand in that water, and bring it up to your own head. And as you touch your forehead, remember that time when once a pastor brought water to your head making the sign of the cross and proclaiming that you belong to God, that through the waters of baptism, you are united with Christ forever. By that sign, by those waters dried long ago, we know who we are, the beloved reflection of God. May it be so. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your grace, that through the waters of baptism we are united with you and with your Son forever. By the power of the Holy Spirit, remind us today that we are yours. Help us to repent, to turn away from all that distracts us and derails us and keeps us from following you. Help us to say yes. Help us to remember and be thankful. We pray in your holy name. Amen. My friends, as we stand and sing our closing hymn, I remind you that the altar is open, and I would be happy to meet you there and pray with you or if you are in need today. Let us stand and sing together hymn 398, Jesus Calls Us.